Hello everyone! Welcome to another exciting Camp Cretaceous video by Jeremy James Project. Throughout Camp Cretaceous, we followed Ben Pincus on an extraordinary journey and witnessed an inspiring transformation along the way. From an anxious and edgy teenager to a brave and tenacious young man, Ben experienced an adventure unlike any other. The most notable chapter of Ben's journey is when he was separated from the other campers and had to survive on his own. And it's within this chapter that Ben's character grew tremendously. He overcame his fears and endured the dangers of Isla Nublar. But how? How does someone who's basically afraid of his own shadow learn how to live off the land, eat things that would make a billy goat puke, and survive on an island with dinosaurs? Of course, Camp Cretaceous explored this topic in Season 2, Episode 5. The entire episode was dedicated to how Ben survived, and while it did get the point across, it still wasn't the entire story. Ben was on his own for several weeks. There's only so much story that can be told in just one episode in less than 30 minutes. Now, in this episode, it is evident that a long period of time passes throughout Ben's journey, because Ben found his courage the same day he scared away Baby Bumpy. But in the very next scene, his clothes show significant wear and tear, and when he reunites with Bumpy, she's grown up. These aren't things that just happen overnight, so because of this, there are some gaps in Ben's story. So what could have happened? How did Ben survive during all that time? That's where this video comes in. I'm going to talk in depth about how Ben survived on Isla Nublar, both on screen and off screen. Here's how it'll work. I'm going to look at a variety of categories and explore how Ben survived as it pertains to each category. I'm going to use all relevant episodes of Camp Cretaceous that have been released so far as the main basis of information. So let's get started. Let's explore how Ben survived on Isla Nublar, and we'll begin by looking at our first category, Shelter. If you were stranded on an island with dinosaurs, shelter is arguably the first thing you'd want to find, and that's exactly what Ben set out to do. In this case, he tried to find shelter by heading back to the main park. Unfortunately, Ben quickly realized that the path to the main park was guarded by Toro the Carnotaurus. With no other way to safety, Ben was isolated in that particular region of Isla Nublar, Toro guarding the only way out. Ben knew he was going to be there a while, so he spent nearly an entire day building a shelter from scratch. At first glance, it didn't look like much. Even Ben said so. But Ben's a lot smarter than he gives himself credit for, because he actually constructed what's known as a lean-to shelter, a common type of shelter used in survival and camping situations. Despite its simplistic appearance, this shelter gave Ben a lot of benefits. For one thing, the leaning palm fronds of the shelter acted as a canopy that protected Ben from the elements, such as the hot sun and even insects, hence the name lean-to shelter. Another notable feature of Ben's shelter was its structural integrity. It may not have been able to withstand a dinosaur attack, but every day and every night, Ben's shelter remained sturdy. If they're not set up properly, lean-to shelters won't handle strong winds very well. Thankfully for Ben, this wasn't the case, because he built his shelter alongside a large fallen tree, which served as a solid foundation as well as a wind guard. Finally, the last thing about Ben's shelter to take note of is the pile of palm fronds inside the shelter. Even though Isla Nublar is in a warm tropical climate, it can still get cold at night, and one of the ways the human body loses heat is through a process called conduction. Basically, it's when heat is lost when something comes into physical contact with a colder surface. For example, if you touch a block of ice with your hand, your hand gets cold because it loses its body heat to the ice. In Ben's case, the colder surface in question was the ground itself. The ground is cold, especially at night, and through the process of conduction, the ground will absorb your body heat if you lay directly on top of it. So the best way to prevent that is to insulate the surface of the ground, but Ben didn't exactly have an air mattress with him. So Ben did something else smart and creative, and laid down palm fronds to use as a bed to keep warm. That way, he wouldn't lose his body heat to the ground. While he may not have been able to use the palm fronds right away, they still served their purpose. Just ask Bumpy. Overall, Ben was smart enough to use nature and its surroundings to his advantage to build a reliable shelter, which was conveniently located near many necessities needed for survival, one of them being our next category, water. Especially since Isla Nublar is in a tropical climate, it was important for Ben to have water. During their foraging, Ben and Bumpy found a flowing river of fresh, clean water. Luckily, Ben's shelter was close by, so he didn't have to travel very far to get water. 
Best of all, it was essentially an endless water supply. It was quickly established that this was Ben's primary source of water, and he had no problems with it. But for the sake of conversation, let's say that he did. Let's say that Ben had the same problem with his river that the other campers had with their river when it stopped flowing because it was dammed. How's Ben supposed to get water then? Luckily, there are three other ways Ben could get water, one of which can be seen in the show. The first way is to collect rainwater, probably inside a small digging hole since Ben didn't have a bottle. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? Ideally, yes, but there's a slight problem with that. If we take into account that the events in Camp Cretaceous begin in December of 2015, then Isla Nublar would be in its dry season. Rainfall would not be a common occurrence, so waiting for rain in the dry season would not be the best course of action. The second way that Ben could get water is by digging a hole in the dry stream bed to access the groundwater within the earth. For those of you who don't know, groundwater is exactly what it sounds like. It's the water that's found underground within the spaces of soil, sand, and rock. Once Ben digs deep enough, the hole will gradually fill with water. A simplified example of this idea can be seen in the Disney movie Dinosaur, where Aladar digs a hole to find water in the dry lake bed. Of course, if Ben finds water by digging, it might be a little dirty, but that's okay. Ben could use a piece of his shirt as a makeshift filter to filter the dirty water to a certain degree. Finally, the third way that Ben could get water is the one that can be seen in the show. If you look closely, Bumpy can be seen on more than one occasion drinking water that's been collected in some big leaves. You might be wondering, where did that water come from? It didn't rain. It was the dry season. And you'd be right. At least on screen, there hasn't been any rain since Ben's been on his own. But even if it doesn't rain, there's still another way to find water. The answer? Morning dew. Not familiar with dew? That's okay. Here's another quick science lesson for you. Dew is the moisture that forms as a result of condensation, the process in which something changes from a gas form to a liquid form. Dew forms as temperatures drop and objects cool down. If the object becomes cold enough, the air around the object will also get cold, and cold air is less able to hold water vapor as opposed to warm air. This forces the water vapor in the air around the cold objects to condense, and when that happens, small water droplets are formed, and these water droplets are what's known as dew. Reiterating that Isla Nublar is in a tropical climate, it's very humid, and as a result, much more likely to experience dew than in non-humid areas. And dew can be found on surfaces such as leaves or grass, and since those were in every direction, Ben would have all kinds of places to find water this way just like Bumpy did. So to wrap up the water category, Ben's main water source was the river nearby. Of course, if he wanted to, Ben could also collect dew from the leaves just like Bumpy did. There are other methods Ben could have used to find water, but given his location and circumstances, they weren't necessary. Either way, when it came to water, Ben was okay. Now let's move on to the next category, food. Given Ben's unique circumstances, it would seem that food would be the most difficult thing to find. Remember, Ben was confined to a specific area of the island. He couldn't explore outside this area without running into Toro again, so he had to make do with whatever he could find in the general area. Thankfully, with a little help from Bumpy, Ben found berries growing on shrubs. They were safe to eat and were in abundant supply. Throughout his journey, Ben is frequently seen eating these berries for sustenance. But even though these berries were plentiful, Ben had to be careful and consume them sparingly because they were still a limited resource. But that's okay, because berries weren't the only thing Ben ate to survive. If you remember from Season 2, Episode 6, Kenji makes a comment about Ben being a guy who eats bugs, as Ben is seen eating a grub with ease. This suggests that at some point off-screen, Ben became accustomed to eating insects as well. This was great because Ben could find insects just about anywhere, either by digging in the dirt or by flipping over big rocks, for instance. But a really good place to rustle up some grub is the fallen tree that Ben used for his shelter. Rotting trees are an excellent source of all kinds of insects. So to quickly recap the food category so far, Ben survived by eating berries and insects. But there's one more thing Ben could have eaten to survive. Fish. Remember, Ben stayed close to the river, and he forged a spear, which I'll talk more about later. Although it's not shown or mentioned, Ben could have speared a fish to eat. Now you might be asking, wouldn't Ben get sick by eating raw fish? And that's a good point. 
If Ben ate raw fish, there's a good chance he could get sick from the bacteria or parasites inside it. So to avoid getting sick, Ben's best bet would be to cook the fish. And now you might be asking, how would he do that? And how fitting, because you're about to find out as we explore the next category, fire. This category may surprise you, but it's true. Ben made fire. Unfortunately, this was not explored in Camp Cretaceous, and the only evidence is on screen for just a few seconds. Even for eagle-eyed viewers it's easy to miss. But that's okay, because you might just see something new today. Look closely in the background when Ben gets up and walks off. You can see a pile of burnt debris and a circle of rocks around the debris, which indicates that at some point, Ben made a fire. So now that we've seen the signs that Ben's made fire before, how did he actually do it? The answer can be found in the very scene I just showed you. When Ben's sharpening his spear with a rock, you can see sparks forming. Certain types of rocks can create sparks when they're rubbed together, which could then be used to ignite a pile of dry leaves or tree bark to create a fire. And that's exactly what Ben did. And since Ben was able to make fire, there are so many things he could do with it. For this video, I'll go over three of them. The first use being what I referred to earlier, cooking the fish. This way, Ben could safely eat it without getting sick from it. The second use is the most important one, being able to keep warm, especially at night, because as I mentioned earlier in the shelter category, even a warm tropical island like Isla Nublar can still get cold. Of course, Ben's fire itself would keep him warm, but there's also another way to keep warm. If we recall this shot of Ben's shelter, we can recall the rocks circled around what was once a fire. Whenever Ben made fire, the rock circle that contained his fire would get hot and Ben could use these hot rocks to heat the inside of his shelter. So there were a couple different ways fire could help Ben keep warm, both direct and indirect. Now for the third use. Ben could also use fire to light a tree branch and use it as a torch, or as a weapon to protect himself from dinosaurs. It may not inflict any fatal damage, especially against bigger dinosaurs like Toro, but it could at least keep them away from his shelter. Speaking of keeping things away, this last advantage comes from a byproduct of fire. Smoke. The smoke from the fire can help keep insects away to a certain degree. To summarize this category, fire may not have been shown directly, but after examining the clues on screen, it's undeniable that Ben made fire at some point in his journey off screen. To quickly recap all the categories so far, Ben had shelter, water, food, and fire, four of the most crucial necessities for survival. But would these be enough to ensure his survival? What would happen if Ben were ever in danger? Would he be able to defend himself? Let's explore this and proceed to the next category, defense. When Ben first started his journey, he didn't have anything to defend himself with. But that was okay for the time being, because he had Bumpy by his side, an ankylosaurus, a dinosaur built for defense. She may have only been a baby at the time, but she still proved to be quite the protector. She protected Ben from a pack of compies, and she even gave him a push to escape from Toro. Unfortunately, after a little mishap with his shelter, Ben let his anger get the better of him, and he scared Bumpy away in a fit of rage. Without his watchful companion by his side, Ben was truly on his own now. He would have to defend himself by any means necessary. Luckily for Ben, he learned how. And he learned quickly. As seen in Camp Cretaceous, Ben's most notable method of defense was his spear that he forged. Now it's possible that Ben made more than one spear over the course of his journey, each one stronger than the last. He made these spears by using a tree branch for the shaft, sharpened rocks for the spearhead, and tied it together with what looked like vines. Ben learned to wield these spears very well. He had good form and superb accuracy. This proved useful in his battle with Toro when Ben managed to deliver a good slice across Toro's snout. Now of course, Toro's skin is very thick, so this spear on its own would not be enough to actually kill Toro in the conventional way. But for the sake of conversation, there is one unconventional way Ben could kill Toro with his spear, or at least land a more devastating hit. If Ben detached the spearhead from the shaft, similar to what's seen in Disney's Tarzan, and held onto it when he was on top of Toro's head, he could stab Toro in the eye, similar to what's seen in Clash of the Dinosaurs when a Triceratops stabs a T-Rex in the eye with its horn. So Ben had a weapon to protect himself with, but that wasn't all he had. When Ben reappears after the scene in which he finds his courage, he's wearing what appeared to be a handguard, an armguard, and an armband, all of which he fashioned out of tree bark and vines. 
It certainly gives him the look of a strong survivor, but these things weren't just for show. They helped prevent him from getting cuts or bruises he could get by doing just about anything in his everyday foraging, whether it's climbing trees with rough bark or gathering food in prickly bushes, for instance. As for Ben's armband, its main function was to absorb sweat, therefore preventing it from running down his arms, making his foraging a little easier. Now there's one other item of interest Ben could have used to survive, but it's not actually shown in Camp Cretaceous. It's not even mentioned either. So what is it? The answer to that can be found in Ben's Camp Cretaceous Dino Escape toy by Mattel. In this toy, Ben is seen dressed in his survival gear, and he also comes with some accessories, including his spear and something that looks like a shield. This shield appears to be made out of tree bark, leaves, and vines, in toy form, of course. Now, the use for the shield is pretty straightforward. Ben could use it to protect himself from attacks by smaller dinosaurs, or he could use it as an extension of his shelter. However, as of the end of Season 3, there's no evidence to suggest that Ben had a shield at any point. So the shield seen in the toy is probably only meant to be a bonus accessory, something extra, just for fun. Or, maybe this could hint at something we'll see in a future episode of Camp Cretaceous. We'll just have to wait and see about that. Either way, when it came to defense, Ben was continuously finding new ways to protect himself by using his natural surroundings. He was creative enough to make tools and other means of protection, so that if he were ever attacked, he would at least have a chance to defend himself. So in regards to the categories discussed up until now, Ben had all the basics covered as well as a means of defense. But it was also important for Ben to take care of his physical well-being as well. So let's expand on this in the next category, physical health. For this category, I'm going to go over the more common scenarios Ben encountered as it relates to his physical health. Wherever Ben went, he had to navigate all kinds of terrain, from thick jungle to open clearings. Especially when it comes to more rugged terrain such as hills or even by climbing trees, it's possible that Ben could overexert himself and sprain his ankle or pull a muscle for instance. While these may not be life-threatening injuries, they can still cause discomfort, which could make Ben's foraging more difficult. So what could Ben do to remedy that? Remember the hot rocks discussed in the fire category? Ben could apply these hot rocks to the affected area for temporary pain relief. But what if Ben were to sustain something a little more severe, like a flesh wound for instance? Well, oddly enough, he did. Ben suffered a skin abrasion near his left shoulder during his battle with Toro. When Ben was on top of Toro's head, his shoulder scraped against Toro's horn and rough skin. But immediately after the battle with Toro, Ben's wound is no longer visible, as well as the mud covering his body, so this could potentially be another time gap in Ben's story, and that Ben likely tended to his wound off screen. But how? With what? How about coconut oil from the coconuts growing all over Isla Nublar? Natural coconut oil has both antibacterial and antifungal properties, which help reduce the risk of infection, as well as help wounds heal faster. Fortunately, Ben's wound was just a minor skin abrasion and not something more severe like a laceration. So because Ben's wound was relatively small, the coconut oil would be easy to apply and would help him heal faster. With enough caution, flesh wounds are preventable, but there's one thing on Ben's journey that was unpreventable, the sun. In Season 2, Episode 6, Ben bragged about being sunburned for three days straight. Apart from the obvious damage to his skin, Ben's lucky he didn't suffer a heat stroke as well. Being in a tropical climate, with the hot, blazing sun beating down on you all day, the human body's temperature will undoubtedly rise, and if it doesn't stay hydrated or cooled down, it's only going to keep rising. Eventually, the body will suffer a heat stroke. At this point, the body can't control its temperature, which can then lead to vital organ damage, and in the worst case scenario, death. If Ben did suffer a heat stroke, he would have needed someone to give him medical attention as soon as possible, and since there wasn't anybody around to do that, he would have died. So how did Ben protect himself from the sun? Mud, that's how. Not only does mud serve as a natural scent cover, it can also serve as a natural sunscreen. Other animals such as elephants and hippos cover themselves in mud all the time to protect themselves from the sun. As we see later on in Season 2, Episode 5, Ben is seen covered in dirt and mud, protecting his skin from the sun's powerful UV rays. Ben even used a part of his shirt as a headband to help protect his head from the sun as well. Ben came up with lots of different ways to take care of his body, but what about his mind? Let's explore this in our final category, mental health. 
The purpose of this category is not to psychoanalyze Ben or to provide a diagnosis, but rather to discuss Ben's state of mind throughout his adventure. There's no doubt that being stranded on an island with dinosaurs would definitely take a toll on someone's mental health, especially someone as anxious as Ben was. Ben was known to have a multitude of fears, some rational and some not. For example, in the case of the former, Ben was afraid of germs. Whenever Ben was worried about germs, he would use hand sanitizer as a coping mechanism. Only this time, once his journey began, Ben didn't have any hand sanitizer on him. Without his usual coping methods, Ben was already anxious from the germs alone. To make matters worse, when Ben realized he was lost and in danger, he started to panic. He didn't have any way of coping with his situation. To top it all off, Ben then sees what appears to be a leech latched onto his leg. With all these things overwhelming Ben, he couldn't take any more of it, and he fainted. When Ben recovered and continued on his way, he encountered many dangerous situations such as Toro and the Compies. Whenever Ben found himself in these uncomfortable situations, he would run away. On the surface, one might think that Ben's just being a coward, but that's not the case. There's more to it than that. He's actually demonstrating something that's often referred to as a fight versus flight response. Whenever a person is presented with a dangerous situation, they make a choice to either fight the danger or take flight from it. Every person has this natural instinctive response within them. These responses are evolutionary adaptations to increase chances of survival in threatening situations. Again, in Ben's case, every time he found himself in an uncomfortable situation, he would flee from it, take flight so to speak. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes it's better to flee from danger and live to see another day. At the same time, however, sometimes fleeing is not an option. If you want to live to see another day, you may have to fight back. In Ben's case, when he was surrounded by compies at night, he had nowhere to run and no other choice, so he chose to fight back. But more on that soon. As far as Ben's mental health goes, his mind was always racing from the constant danger he found himself in, so he didn't have many opportunities to take a step back and refocus. But even if he wasn't in immediate danger, his mental well-being was still at risk. More specifically, Ben had difficulty sleeping because he was too afraid to even go to sleep. It's implied that Ben tried to stay awake all night, every night, but he even had difficulty doing that. Of course, it didn't help that Bumpy took his bed every night either. Every morning, Ben was clearly exhausted from the lack of sleep. He may have only slept for a few hours a day, and this routine went on for at least a whole week. A lack of sleep undoubtedly contributed to Ben's mental health. He was unfocused, anxious, and very irritable. As I mentioned earlier, Ben let his emotions get the better of him and he scared Bumpy away. This did not bode well for Ben's mental health either. Bumpy was a companion for Ben, a friend, someone he could talk to to keep himself company, similar to how people talk to their pet dogs for instance. Bumpy protected Ben and gave him a sense of comfort and security. But with Bumpy gone, Ben no longer had that feeling of security. So with all these factors working against Ben, how did he manage to bounce back and strengthen his mind in the process? Simply put, he adapted. He may not have realized it at first, but Ben was slowly but surely improving his mind through a process known as habituation. Every day, Ben was surrounded by things that made him uncomfortable, whether it was dinosaurs, the heat, getting all sweaty and dirty, etc. These are examples of what are called stressors. These stressors were always a part of Ben's survival routine in one way or another. They weren't going anywhere, so Ben gradually became habituated to his surroundings. The more Ben was exposed to these stressors, the less afraid of them he got over time. This is most evident after Ben finds his courage. Ben finally confronted and conquered his fears, and once he did, everything became easier for him. Things that scared him before didn't scare him anymore. In fact, he scared them. Things he had trouble doing before were much easier now, like climbing the big tree. And even though Bumpy was absent for a time, Ben occasionally talked to himself to more or less keep himself company. To conclude this category, Ben's mental health developed a newfound sense of focus, balance, and clarity. And with this new mindset, Ben was able to persevere. With every obstacle that Ben faced, he had a solution. And with every experience, Ben continued to learn, grow, and realize his potential. Ben displayed great intelligence, resourcefulness, and most of all, bravery. All of which were inside of him all along. He just needed that extra push. 
Once he found his courage and overcame his fears, he went from barely getting by every day to thriving every day. Not only did Ben become a part of the island, the island also became a part of him. Ben continued to adapt, and most importantly, survive on his adventure. An adventure that undoubtedly changed his life forever. Camp Cretaceous did an outstanding job of telling Ben's story of survival. And while we may not have seen everything that happened, we saw enough to realize this one undeniable fact. Ben Pincus is a true survivor. With that said, this concludes another video by Jeremy James Prudchick. What other kinds of things do you think Ben could have done to survive? Did I miss anything worth mentioning? Talk about it in the comments and have some fun. Thank you for watching. I hope you had as much fun watching this video as I did making it. If you want to see more Jurassic content, you can find lots more of it on my channel. And if you want to keep seeing more Jurassic content, subscribe! Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.